So I need this to make sure I can show it at you. Anyway, um, it will be very short. Uh, to be honest, uh, even though it's a demo lecture, uh, real-time class will be very different. Uh, in class, it will be pretty tight in terms of time. Uh, there are lots of topics to cover. So in class, it will be pretty intense, pretty quick. But since we're having a nice, relaxing day, it will be slightly different. So um, here, it's probably more conceptual we'll talk about instead of going through the details. Plus, one of the perks of in AI is you got to travel quite a bit and see interesting things. I was in a Sichuan village over the last week looking at um, uh, commercial real estates in third, fourth line cities in Sichuan. It's beautiful, except the food. It's good if you had it once in a while, but if you had it for one week, and all they have is fake McDonald's. So not even McDonald's in those cities. They have fake McDonald's, they have fake Pizza Hut, and they have fake KFCs. And so when I'm having lunch and dinner, here they give you a bowl of rice or, or soup. There, there's about three inch of oil in everything they cook. So my friend told me, oh, you have to blow on the soup to blow away the oil and drink the soup underneath. So I tried that as well. It doesn't work. Because underneath, it's all pepper sauce <laughs> and soup. So it's make it worse by having oil and pepper soup at the same time. So I've been feeling not very well. If you know you get a very bad hangover, everything you think about, you want to throw up, <laughs> right? I have an oil hangover over the last three days. It's like being pregnant. Everything I thought about, <laughs> I want to throw up. So it'll be very short today. But about me first, um, I'm from Hong Kong. But I went to school in the US, um, and I worked there. I finished MBA. I was at, uh, at an iBank for a few years uh, in New York, Singapore, and here. Uh, and then uh, in the good old days, you get to retire very early. So I retired early, as everyone does. Um, I was having fun for a few years, but it gets boring as well. So I came back, and I do my doctoral and teach in various places. Uh, so it's been pretty interesting. But teaching this is good because it keeps me up to date. Because many, uh, many people that take the class are in the business, so uh, they'll let me uh, know about the latest things people are doing, all the gossips about the industry, so it's interesting in this sense. But uh, compared to what Joanne had talked about, we're slightly different in that um, we're sort of like the cliff notes of the English class. So in, in when I first went to US for school in high school, English was terrible. Because here we're learning grammars and things. There I went there, the first thing they tell me is here, there's this 10 Eng English books. Uh, Shakespeare's, uh, um, uh, several other intense books that I never even finished reading. So Cliff Notes come to my rescue. We're similar. There's lots of material. Uh, for example, formulas you might see. It looks terrible, but if you know how the formula work, it's actually very easy to figure out what the correct answer can be. Even if you forget what the formula is about, if you know what it's trying to do, you can pretty much narrow it down from one to four to one to two out of the answers you're not sure about. So what we do is slightly different. Hopefully, if you understand what's going on, um, it will help you as well in passing the exam. Another thing is, I guess this is what we're trying to do. Another thing is, I guess if you do this class, I actually have several students that say they do it for fun, which is great. For the others, you do this for a purpose, <laughs> right? You don't want to do this, torture yourself, pay lots of money, and have fun. I mean, if you want, I can do it for you <laughs> outside of this. But when I, in my first job out of MBA, I was at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. They put me on the trading floor. And I was a trainee in a group called a uh, Structure Products Group. It was the most advanced group at that time. It was not too many years ago. There are computers. But we were doing structure products. And I had two PhDs in maths working next to me. And they were Excel, they were doing Excel pricing on, guess what? They call structured products. Uh, it's like the ELN notes today, which if you go to Hang Sang, 
you can do online through a computer, right? Which is very easy, simple product now. But at that time, no one know how to price it. So we're busy all the time with sending to the sales and trading to the salespeople. And a cus customer call, they would run, shout over and say, give me a price of this. And we're busy all day pricing simple ELN notes. But nowadays, it's everywhere. Even, uh, I guess, universities would teach those as entry exercises. So I guess the, the useful thing for this class is, I mean, AI, it's a big topic. There are many, many things in it, but it gets more quantitative over time. Because before, uh, many trading strategies worked if you work by a hunch. But now it's very quantitative driven. Uh, many um, uh, programming skills are used. If you look back 10 years later, you might see complex strategies today being very common in 10 years time. Just like when I look at structured products then, it's a common pr place product. You don't need to do anything to buy it online. So knowing what's going on is very useful. Uh, many people from other areas, they are not actually traders or AI managers, but they deal with them. So many back office or valuation management. Um, nowadays, uh, the, the AI guys, the managers are the master of universe, right? They think they know everything. Actually, we do know everything. But many people that deal with us want to know whether we say it's true or not. So by knowing what we do, uh, if I say something that um, try to uh, <laughs> make you think of something else, of not what I'm doing, at least you would know. So it's helpful in that sense. So here for our course, uh, it's uh, more for a for level one, it's uh, very generic in terms of looking at all the various topics and overview of what they do. Uh, in level two, uh, it's very specific. So we look at areas where uh, they're more focused on calculations or more difficult things to do. Uh, and then we'll work on those in more depth. In terms of um, any helpful, uh, in terms of career, it definitely would be, no matter what you do. Because before, when I was doing uh, in iBank, uh, many accountants would come and ask for valuation and things. And some of them, they spend three days and don't sleep and do calculations all day. If you know what's going on, it's very simple. It's very simple. So this is definitely useful for anything. Here, it's repeat what Joanne had mentioned earlier. Uh, level one, look at everything, good overview. Uh, in level two, more quantitative calculation base. So for the, uh, for the demo today, we'll probably look at more level two material. Because level one, it's more reading uh, and some calculations. So we'll do more level two things. Uh, in terms of studying, when you look at our books, if you bought the textbook from Kayak, you might wonder, I pay Kaplan a lot of money, which I don't get a lot out of that chunk. You get books of similar, similar, similar fonts, similar thickness. So are you wasting your time? I mean, you're, you're paying for something that has probably more reading uh, than the original text. <laughs> so what's the point? You're supposed to get a small cliff note of 10 pages. But what we say is actually different. So um, um, for Kayak, it's a great set of reference tool, which everyone, anyone, anyone would like to have one set on the, on the shelf, because it's more of a combination of many good sources, but it's a very good in-depth source. For the exam, you probably would not need all of those. So in our material, we try to focus on uh, a more uh, allocation-wise on the uh, test material, plus uh, in level two, which um, probably you'll see later on, there's a book on the research paper, which when I do my research paper, it's pretty much I write 200 pages to prove this thing is black, <laughs> which is what I prove at the end. So when you read that book, it's great, lots of good stuff, but you need some concluding of how that relates to the curriculum of what's being tested. And in our book, that's provided. So after reading through the research paper, you know how that applies to the curriculum, which is not in the research paper, because that's not what the guy did in the first place is for. Right? So there's various 
things that help you to study more efficiently and effectively in that sense. So it's the same thickness, but it's more exam focused. So let's do the demo. There are for level two, this is more for level two. Uh, there are two major kinds of calculations. It's not all like this, uh, but they tend to be two, two branches of ways of asking. One is uh, the more difficult but mechanical version of question. So example would be questions on calculation of private equity funds fee. So in that case, uh, it's not a difficult rocket scientist formula thing. It's just if you follow the logic and do it correctly, you get the answer. But you have to be uh, careful and know how the order goes, what's being put in, what's being taken out, and so on. The other is more theoretical. So here you have some formula and some model of pricing something. And it will be hard to do it by hand. It's impossible anyway. But if asked conceptually how the difference work or why it's being done, you need to, uh, in a simple mathematical way, calculate something. Right? So either more difficult but mechanical calculation or more theoretical but the question is just testing if you know the theory part. If you don't know the theory, how it works, then you will not know the answer. But once you know, then it's a very simple calculation. Or you can even eyeball and find the answer. Right? So here are these two types. We'll look at both, but not in details. It takes quite some time to do. This is the first type. This is the mechanical but difficult ones. If you look at a private equity fund, they charge many fees. That's why they drive nice cars and have one wife and five girlfriends. If you saw the movie, what movie is that? The one that just, I missed the movie. Richard Gere. Yeah, is it good? I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Anyone saw the movie? I was away, so I missed it. But it should be good. So how come he drives such a nice car? Nice big overlooking over Central Park, uh, a two-story studio. It's because they charge a lot of fees, right? So they have management fee on commit. There's various ways to calculate, but they charge management fee on a committed amount. So if you say, I give you 50 million, uh, you haven't paid them yet, but you pay them on a full amount, there's organizational fee. So when they start the fund, they would charge you a couple of million for the lawyers and so on. Uh, when they buy or sell the firm, they would charge a transaction fee, and that's based on the transaction size. So if they level up, if they leverage up, so they take my 50 million and buy a 2 billion firm, this is based on the 2 billion, not on the 50 that I committed. So all these are various ways to calculate, and they offset too, to make the matter more interesting. So some fees get offset, so for example, if my transaction fee uh, happens in year three when they buy a firm and it offset part of the management fee. And if it, if it, if it offset is more than the fee for that year, this carry over. So it's not difficult, but it's like doing a very long reputation, computational plus and minus calculation. Right? If you miss a little carry over in one place and you get it wrong. But conceptually, it's not difficult. There's also hurdle rate. So these are add ons. Uh, it's not designed to test for CIA level two. But real life, that's what they do, right? For private equity, they have hurdle rates. So if I'm the manager, you give me 50 to buy firms for you, I would promise you a minimum return before I get my cut of the profit, right? So that uh, makes the calculation much worse because here I pay you your hurdle rate first and then I catch up to my 2080 cut. So another calculation, then it's a clawback provision as well. So if at the end I don't meet the hurdle, you can ask me for my fees back. So that also complicates the calculation. So we'll look at these in this particular thing in class, but not here. So this is the first example of the mechanical but uh, computationally intensive. This is the second type. So this is uh, one of the more theoretical uh, models we use. Uh, when you price options, probably most of you, when you do finance, you do black shows to price an option. Uh, it's nice and easy, uh, 
but it's a calculation based. So there are many shortcomings for that. Uh, the other two we use to do option valuation would be this binomial tree or Monte Carlo simulation. This is the most used most often because it's very nice to use. Uh, you can put in special features very easily. When you run this through uh, a computer software, it's very fast because it's rep rep repetitive. So it's very, very nice to program and run, and it gives pretty good prices. So in this case, the simple version is the price option using bi bi binomial tree. Here we do more complex version, more fun. We take it one step further. So we use the tree to value convertible, which is one of the option, uh, one of the hedge fund uh, strategies before. Instead of pricing normal options, we use it to price convertible bonds and see if there's a pricing discrepancy to arbitrage using the same formula. We also use it for CDS default probabilities. So if you go and ask for CDS pricing, they'll use this to check what's the chance of someone blowing up in two years' time. And they give you the probability using that and give you a price of, you want to buy CDS, what is your basis point per year based on this size, and so on. So we'll use that for that. But instead of doing the details, it'll be fun. So much fun in class. But if, that is my signature, and I give it to him. In 10 years' time, how much do you think that's worth? If Picasso signed his name on the paper before he was famous, and you hold on to it, it's worth quite a bit, right? So here it's the same. When you want to know how much that thing is worth, it depends. Right? What does it depend on? Whether I'm very famous because I get a Nobel Prize in five years' time, or I was teaching some very lazy CI students, and I went crazy and killed all of them, and I got famous for that. But either one, my signature would get very, uh, uh, I guess, uh, worthy of money. So this will be one of the instruments. How much it's worth depends on where I, where I am. Right? So this is where the tree come in. So here, step one is I use a tree to find the possible price of the underlying. So this is a tree tracking where what I do, whether I become Nobel Prize winner or a mass killer. So it trades what happens to me uh, in the first place, and then in the second place, it checks. Given if I win a Nobel Prize, how much is that piece of paper worth? So uh, that, the value of that derives from what I'm worth, which is why it's called derivatives. And so the last step was pretty easy. We just go back and say, oh, 10 years' time, Thomas become uh, a, a Nobel Prize winner three times, and that is worth $10 billion for that piece. So you discount it back PV to today, that's how much it's worth, right? given the probability of that. So that's what the model does for this. Um, so these are things we use. This is my value, going up Nobel Prize, mass killer going down, and then the, the value of that my signature, and then just going back in time. So we'll do those more in, in class. The formula is very easy. There's, this is a, a two-step, so maybe 0.1 second for each step. This is pretty good when you do it uh, in a massive basis. This is just some practice. When you look, it looked terrible. This is more of a level two. Actually, I think it's more introduction. That's probably level two. But when you look at this, I'll give you a few minutes. Uh, see what you think. Can you see okay? So here, it's not really um, something, it's not really calculation. It's just checking to see if you know how a hedge fund manager thinks, 
and what strategy he will do. It's a pretty simple, straight bond calculation. Whether the, if the you go up, what happened to the price? Right, it's a very straightforward question, actually, once you know what it's asking. So here we have, we have a hedge fund arbitrage guy. So here what he does is for arbitrage, he wants to, he, there's only a very small profit margin he makes. So it can be one, two basis point. So he tried to maximize his return, minimum money. So most of the time they use a long and a short. Because if you're long only, you have to pay a lot of money. If you're long and short, you can pretty much offset and use very little of your own money to earn the same one or two basis point. Right, so this is a common strategy they use, long and short. So here, we try to figure out what he should do. Here, uh, if you look at the, the possible combinations, you can eliminate a lot of these. So here it's saying he expects the same U curve shape over the next year. So effectively, I have four, five, six, seven. So the U curve is like this today. And he expects the same U curve next year. Would meaning a year later it would be the same shape, but when I have four, five, six, seven year treasury, next year they become three, four, five, six year. So effectively, if the market yield stays the same, the price of those treasury will change because now they're short by one year in maturity. Right? So here this three uh, this four become a three and so on. So I want to know what happened to them given the current yield and the expected unit year's time and see what I should do. So I'll look at one example. So here, the four year, I don't know what the three year yield is in the market. So this one, there's nothing you can do, right? So if you look at the question, you short a four year, which is impossible. You don't know what the three year yield is. You don't know what you should do. So this one cannot be the right answer, right? You don't know the answer, what to do. If you look at the five year, it's a 4%. Next year, the same paper. If the market becomes 375, so the value should go up, right? Because now the same paper uh, market yield had gone down, so the price should go up for this paper. For, this, for the six year today, it's 375. That is the yield it's giving. But next year becomes a five year. So next year, the market yield is four for the five-year paper. And so if the market yield had gone up, the paper price would have gone down, right? So here, just based on this, you can do all three papers. So if the price gone down, you would short the paper to make money, right? If you expect the price to go up for the five-year paper, you would long it. So same as the seven-year, the yield is four, 450 now. Next year, the market is 375. So the market rate had gone down. Same yield paper, the price would go up. So here, I would long these as well. So I need a combination that gives me the same results. So here, I'm looking at two. I'm long a seven, so this one is correct. I'll short a six, so this one should be the right answer. If I look at the rest, if I know I'm either short a six, this one cannot be right. Right, and then this is as well also not right. So here B would, would be the strategy to use. I would short the six year today and I would long either the five or the seven year treasury. Yeah. So here if you know the rationale it's pretty straightforward. It's just knowing what to look for, then it'll be pretty fast. Of course, uh, all hundred questions will not be like this. <laughs> it will take more than let me see, you have one 180 minutes for three hours. You got 100 questions. 1.8 minutes per question. This would take me longer to do, right? So here you get some that are pretty straightforward, um, and then you would have, as Joanne say, not more than 50 percent of this, and some are probably uh, less intensive. So this is more of letting you see. Uh, it might look bad, but if you know what's going on, it's pretty straightforward. We're just trying to make simple things complex to make sure you know the concept. Other?
one good thing comparatively is for kayak, you have exactly the correct amount of time. You will not, in theory, if you do it properly, you would finish right at on the dot. You will not have extra time. You will not not finish. Um, this is from uh, other people taking CFA and here. CFA is more tricky. For CFA, if I read a simple question, I would thought to myself, is this a tricky question? I better read it twice. And then it wastes time because they have some tricky question in there. C CI is very straightforward. There's, I wouldn't say there's none, but it's not something that will make you worry. So you would just do, think, do the question, and most people finish it right around the, the finishing time. 